Okay. Um, well, uh, welcome uh, uh, for those who, uh, after uh, uh, a, a big conference uh, uh, with uh, having had so much input already uh, at this uh, IPA meeting, uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, that you came and uh, and that you are uh, uh, willing to stay here and learn more about the oxidative stress in early psychosis instead of being in Milan and uh, uh, where the sun is shining currently. Um, and um, I will be, I'm Arjen Sutherland, I'm a psychiatrist, and together with uh, Philip Baumann, we will be chairing this symposium. Um, and um, um, I would like to thank the organizers of the uh, IPA meeting for having uh, organized such an inspiring meeting and for the opportunity to present our findings here. Um, we try to uh, organize a translational symposium, uh, both giving you some uh, fundamental knowledge about the uh, oxidative stress as well as how this uh, uh, turns out or works in the uh, clinical practice. Um, and um, um, we will uh, look at how this can uh, impact your uh, treatment practice uh, currently or in the near future, hopefully. Um, and with that, I would like to, uh, uh, to start and to present uh, you our first speaker, Daniela Dweer. Uh, she is a postdoctoral researcher um, at the Unit for Research on Schizophrenia in the lab of Kim Do, uh, which uh, is a part of the Department of Psychiatry in Lausanne, Switzerland. She will present data. Uh, please come forward. And uh, please, uh, for the ones who have come, just come forward because the, I've noticed before in this symposium when you're in the back, the, uh, the letters are not so big as, um, uh, as you would like them to be. But, um, uh, just as an, as an advice. Um, Daniela will present data on the involvement of the receptor of advanced glycation end products uh, and the interaction between redox dysregulation and neuroinflammation and its relevance for schizophrenia. Daniela. So thank you very much. So uh, indeed, I will start with um, with this presentation about uh, data on animal models. So it will be more on uh, some trying to find some mechanism that induce the oxidative stress and inflammation uh, with relevant for schizophrenia. So. Uh, it is uh, in the laboratory of Professor Kim Do. We are working on the hypothesis that uh, some environmental factors, on one hand, will interact with some uh, genetic uh, vulnerability uh, to induce uh, some to induce the um, some impairments on systems such as the dopaminergic system, the glutamatergic system through NMDA receptor hypofunction, uh, will induce also redox imbalance and uh, increase inflammation. And all this system together converge actually to induce increased oxidative stress. And this oxidative stress in turn uh, can affect uh, on one hand microcircuitry, microcircuits, so um, the network inside one brain regions in which parvalbumin interneurons are um, highly involved, but also macro secrets, which are the, um, the connectivity between different brain regions, uh, in which myelin and oligodendrocytes are mainly involved. And these two circuits uh, impairments will lead to integration and connectivity deficits that are observed in the schizophrenia patients, and this uh, may lead to symptoms and dimension uh, of this disease. And one important aspect to keep in mind is the developmental aspects. Indeed, this interaction and these impairments occurring at some critical time point of uh, the development will affect different aspects of, um, of these circuits. So today I will uh, discuss the interaction between redox and inflammation uh, and how they affect the microcircuits. And uh, later, uh, you will have the presentation of uh, Dr. Philippe Bowman that will uh, discuss this uh, and regarding also these systems, but in humans. So first, uh, what is uh, the general consequences of a redox dysregulation and what is a redox dysregulation? This would be actually uh, the balance between the antioxidants on one hand and the pro-oxidants on the other hand. And actually, when you have 
to match pro-oxidants, this will lead to macromolecules damage, so such as oxidative damage to lipids, proteins, and DNA. But when we have a slight increase of pro-oxidants, this is actually needed for neurotransmission, proliferation, and differentiation. Therefore, the redox balance must be tightly uh, regulated in order to have this, um, this uh, proper functioning of cells. And in schizophrenia, one main antioxidant that has been shown to be involved in the pathophysiology is uh, the glutathione. This tripeptide is a redox regulator and antioxidant that will uh, scavenge reactive oxygen species uh, to protect the cells, but is also involved in uh, the regulation of, uh, of some proteins uh, functions. And in uh, schizophrenia, uh, glutathione levels have been shown to be, de to be decreased in the brain, in some uh, brain regions such, such as prefrontal cortex and cerebrospinal fluid and also uh, some uh, a genetic vulnerability in a polymorphism in the key synthesizing gene for glutathione has been shown to be associated with the disease, inducing a decreased uh, glutathione synthesis in a uh, patient bearing this uh, polymorphism. And on the other hand, as I mentioned before, inflammation is also uh, it also <coughs> been involved in schizophrenia, uh, and there are evidences showing that uh, inflammatory uh, mediators are increased in brain, blood, and CSF, and also uh, microglia and astrocytes are more activated in the brain of these patients. So the consequence of this redox imbalance and uh, pro-inflammatory uh, status, this uh, may affect the parvalbumin fast spiking abiogenic interneurons, which are cells that are very sensitive, especially to oxidative stress. And these cells are very important in maintaining in the, in the network uh, of, the, uh, of the, the excitatory uh, neurons. As you can see here, this excitatory pyramidal neurons will activate the PV interneurons that will inhibit this neuron. And this, um, these circuits will induce uh, oscillation in the gamma frequency and uh, that are very important for, uh, for the network. And in schizophrenia, it has been shown that PV, but also the perineuronal net, which is an extracellular matrix enwrapping uh, the PV interneurons, uh, are decreased in patients. The gamma oscillation has been shown to be altered also. And the NMDA APO function has been shown uh, on the parvalbumin interneurons. And these together uh, may lead to some cognitive deficits that are observed uh, in schizophrenia. So now, what is the link uh, between redox dysregulation and new inflammation? Because it is known that the ROS can induce the activation of inflammatory cells, such as microglia and astrocytes. And then, when these cells are activated, they can induce a secretion of ROS. So it is known that these two processes are interacting, but the precise mechanism, how, it is, uh, how this interaction occurs, is not really well understood. And so in this work, uh, we are proposing that this receptor for advanced glycation end product, which is a receptor on the membrane of some cells, may be the candidate that induces this interaction. So why uh, this uh, rage? On one hand, uh, the ligands that bind the rage are produced when there is oxidative stress. This is this advanced glycation end product that will be discussed uh, right after by uh, Professor Sutherland. And then um, another type of ligands that uh, activate rage are also produced when there is uh, inflammation. They are secreted by astrocytes. And when this, uh, this receptor is activated, it will induce both inflammation through NF-kappa-B activation, but also oxidative stress through NADPH uh, oxidase activation. And in schizophrenia, there are not a lot of evidences uh, yet, but some studies shown that the ligand S100 beta and uh, RAGE are increased in serum uh, of schizophrenia patients, as well as this ligand AGE. 
So we are working, as, I, as I discussed, the uh, main role of glutathione. Uh, we are working on a mouse model that has, um, that has a deletion in the gene that encodes the modulatory subunit of the key synthesizing gene for glutathione, meaning that this mice has a 70% decrease of glutathione and therefore increased oxidative stress. And what is interesting is that this mouse model show uh, morphological, functional, but also behavioral impairment that are related to schizophrenia. And we looked at different periods of the development for neuroinflammation and rage pathway. So first, what has been already described and published uh, by uh, Kabunkal and colleagues is that uh, in young uh, mice at P40, there is a decreased PV and PNN, which are the extracellular matrix and wrapping PV, uh, early during um, childhood and peripubertal stage of these mice. And on, other, uh, on another hand, when we add an additional oxidative challenge during childhood, this lead to a persistent uh, decrease of PV and PNN in adulthood. And so we were interested to see uh, what is the mechanism that induced this long-lasting effect and uh, also this uh, effect in young uh, mice. So here the aim of this study was first to find a mechanism by which oxidative stress and new inflammation interact during critical developmental period, which could affect PVI, PNN circuitry. And in a second step, identify potential target with the aim to interfere with the proposed mechanism in order to restore normal PVI PNN circuitry. So first we looked whether oxidative stress in our model could induce microglia activation, so neuroinflammation. And so in parallel to oxidative stress, as you can see here, uh, by DNA oxidation, we indeed found increased microglia activation at, uh, at this age of uh, peripubertal stage. And when we compared during the development, we could see that actually uh, at peripubertal stage, so early developmental stages of the mice, there was more pronounced oxidative stress and more pronounced neuroinflammation, suggesting that this period could, uh, could be uh, the right period to look at to find a mechanism. So then we looked whether this, in our mouse model, the oxidative stress uh, was um, uh, inducing some rage uh, change, changes. And so recently some data showed that actually this receptor could be cleaved at the membrane, inducing a soluble form that goes to, to the environment and an intracellular domain that goes to the nucleus. And so to look at this process, we used two uh, different um, uh, antibodies to tag the extracellular part in red and the intranuclear part in green, and which allow us to see that in the GCM knockout mice, we had a decreased membrane-bound rage, so decreased red signal, in parallel to an increase uh, of the intranuclear rage in the nucleus by the uh, green signal. And so we were asking how this uh, process is occurring, and it was suggested that maybe MMP9, which is a metalloproteinase, uh, could be involved in this process. So MMP9 was interesting because so it is a matrix metal metalloproteinase that uh, cleaves the extracellular matrix, but also proteins, and it is activated when there is oxidative stress. And first we saw that there was increase of this protein in uh, the brain of this GCLM knockout mice, suggesting that it may play a role. So I don't have time now to show you all the steps uh, that we uh, did to show this, so I will uh, summarize for you the, the main hypothesis that we found. So we found that indeed in our mouse model, oxidative stress induced activation of MMP9. MMP9 was inducing rage shedding, and allowing the intranuclear domain going here in the nucleus. There was also increased activation of NF-kappa-B, which is the main transcription factor involved in uh, inflammation. And this may lead to increased uh, cytokines, but also MMP9, that would then activate the microglia. And it is known that microglia will further increase ROS production. 
So in, in this hypothesis, we have this uh, feed-forward uh, loop that will actually induce more inflammation and more oxidative stress. And then, based on this, uh, we hypothesize that maybe if we stop this, so we prevent MMP9 activation, maybe this would prevent this uh, vicious cycle. And so this is uh, what uh, we tried in this model I presented just before, when we have an additional oxidative stress at juvenile stage, and this induces increased oxidative stress, but also microglia activation, and decreased PV interneurons in adulthood. So in this model, we ask whether uh, the inhibition of rage MMP9 pathway at peripubertal stage could prevent the persistent increase in oxidative stress and microglia activation, and this would allow a rescue of the PVI maturation impairments observed in these mice. So this is a pro protocol that we did, this additional uh, oxidative challenge in uh, young mice, and right after, we uh, treated the mice with an MMP9-specific inhibitor. <laughs> and then we waited until uh, adulthood. And what we could observe that, as you can see here, the increased oxidative stress and microglia activation in adult GCLM knockout mice, this was prevented by this MMP9 inhibitor. Then we moved for PV interneurons, and uh, what you can see here, the decrease of, P of PV and decrease of PNN could be also be reversed by this MMP9 inhibitor, so uh, treated after the challenge. So uh, if we now think for translation, here in the animal model, we saw that we have a redox dysregulation, uh, so through glutathione deficit, that lead to this MMP9 rage pathway activation that lead to a persi persistent oxidative and microglia uh, activation, and this lead to PVI maturation impairments. Now, if we uh, try to translate this for humans, it is known that uh, redox this regulation uh, may be involved in the pathophysiology of schizophrenia. Now, MMP9 and RAGE, there are some evidences that they are increased in patients, and also some polymorphism exists that are associated with schizophrenia. But now the, the, the idea would be to see whether this uh, induces the PVI and PNN deficit that is also observed in uh, patients. So this would be, of course, uh, the next step. So to summarize the main findings, we uh, identify a mechanism by which oxidative stress and inflammation interact and induce PVI and PNN maturation deficits. Uh, this would uh, maybe a novel drug target for treatment and prevention. And this also, this rage MMP9 pathway could be also a potential mechanism-based biomarker for early detection of the disease. So I would like to thank uh, Professor Kim Do, uh, with whom I'm working uh, now, and also uh, all the clinicians with whom we are uh, collaborating in order to make this translation uh, to humans. And thank you for your attention. If the drug that you use for to inhibit uh, metalloproteinase uh, uh, can be used in the in human, or is there any uh, so suspicion that some could be? Yeah. So actually, this specific uh, molecule that we used uh, is uh, not uh, used uh, right now for humans. The main problem, even if we try to um, to see for a derivative or something, the main problem is that MMP9 is involved in a lot of other processes. And of course, when you give it, uh, it will act uh, peripherally, but also in the brain. And especially, it is really involved in the synaptic pruning, in um, so in uh, dendritic uh, morphology. So if we think to treat early, uh, so during the adolescence, this is really the period where this um, maturation of uh, synapses occur. So it may be a problem to completely inhibit MMP9. But this is why we are now 
thinking of uh, maybe more uh, try to modulate MMP9, for example, through antioxidants. So this is a talk that was just before, that maybe antioxidants may act through uh, MMP9 inhibition, and this would be more modulation than a complete inhibition. So uh, we will we'll be talking about advanced glycation uh, end product shortly. If the um, um, oxidative stress causes the, re the receptor for, ox for these um, uh, ligands uh, uh, to, be, to not be on the um, cell surface anymore, does that mean that the plasma levels of these uh, ages uh, increase as well? Do you know that? Yeah, so this, uh, this is our prediction that there will be, uh, if you have increased uh, rage shedding, you would have increased uh, rage in the plasma of patients. So this is something that we are testing right now, indeed. <clears throat> okay, um, I'm very happy to introduce um, Dr. Sutherland. Um, he's a psychiatrist at the Early Psychosis Department of the Academic Medical Center, um, connected to the University of uh, Amsterdam, and um, he will talk about um, advanced glycation in products and cardiovascular risk in relation to inflammation and oxidative stress in recent onset um, psychosis. Okay, thank you, Philip. Um, yes, here we are. Um, well, thank you for already um, uh, telling what where I'm going to talk about, so I will quickly move on. Um, uh, and I would like to start uh, with showing you an uh, absolute mortality rate in schizophrenia, um, uh, whereby the red column, as depicted here, is the absolute risk of a uh, patient with schizophrenia dying from cardiovascular disease. And I would like you to compare that with the risk of uh, 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 dying of suicide, uh, something which are, we are very concerned about. Uh, 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 me as well in, uh, in my clinical practice, uh, but if you look at the big killer, it's cardiovascular disease. Um, and uh, probably you all know why. I mean, there is an increased uh, prevalence of uh, cardiovascular risk factors in our patients. They have increased levels of obesity, uh, they smoke more, um, and they have more substance abuse than the, the uh, healthy population. Um, or the general population, I should say. They have more often metabolic syndrome, lack of physical exercise, bad dietary habits, and diabetes. Um, but additionally, the incidence and prevalence of cardiovascular disease is um, related to increased oxidative stress and low-grade inflammation. And uh, it would be interesting to speculate whether uh, this uh, um, high prevalence of cardiovascular disease is actually an intrinsic characteristic of schizophrenia. Um, we know in antipsychotic naive patients that insulin resistance is uh, already present, and there's evidence um, suggesting that increased oxidative stress and low-grade inflammation contribute to the pathophysiology of uh, schizophrenia, as uh, Daniela and earlier symposium have already um, uh, told you. Uh, but also, this is implicated in the uh, onset uh, of cardiovascular disease. And we know that oxidative stress is a mediator of advanced glycation end product formation, as Daniela has already um, uh, told you. Uh, so what are these um, uh, advanced glycation end products? Um, they are um, oxidized proteins and lipids, which are uh, formed in a non-enzymatic way. And uh, these ages, as th that's the abbreviation, so that I don't have to repeat this long word uh, the, the whole time, uh, they can form irreversible links with um, uh, long-lived proteins, particularly collagen in the extracellular matrix, and they accumulate in these tissues during the, uh, the lifetime of humans. And they can be measured by fluorescence methods. For example, they have been measured decades ago already in skin biopsies. Uh, and these ages are uh, related to the development and progression of cardiovascular disease, uh, independent of traditional cardiovascular risk factors. And this is a, a schematic representation of how ages can be uh, formed. And as Daniela pointed out, oxidative stress uh, has a role in the uh, formation of advanced glycation end products such as pentosidine, glucosapine, uh, carboxymethylysine, and um, and these ages can induce uh, inflammation, as uh, Daniela has uh, eloquently uh, presented you. Um, and 
ages can now be measured non-invasively uh, in, in humans just by putting your uh, forearm on this device, uh, which, is, uh, which they call the age reader, uh, a very smart uh, 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 name, I think. Um, and this um, age accumulation corresponds with uh, uh, plasma levels of ages. Um, and there has already been one study uh, in France of uh, Youssef Kouirat, who looked at this skin age uh, measurement uh, in chronic schizophrenia patients and uh, 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 compared that to age and gender match controls, and it was uh, uh, increased. Uh, and this is how ages accumulate um, uh, normally in the healthy validation cohort. And when your age level is high, you have an increased risk of uh, developing cardiovascular disease. And this is uh, another, um, uh, this has been developed in the diabetes field and cardiology field. And when you have patients with small uh, artery vessel disease, uh, if you, um, um, they have followed up for five years, patients with small artery vessel disease, uh, about 250 patients, and they uh, divided them in three groups. And the one with the worst, so the highest uh, age, skin ages, uh, had the worst outcome. They had the, the biggest chance of uh, developing major uh, adverse cardiovascular events compared to the group depicted in green with the um, uh, lowest uh, age measurement. Um, and interestingly, in the diabetes field, they have looked at development of brain atrophy, so uh, decreased gray matter volume, um, uh, because we, they know in the diabetes field that this is a risk when you have diabetes for a long time. And they show that uh, it, indeed the uh, skin ages were significantly associated with lower gray matter volume, as well as with cognitive impairment, uh, independent of other risk factors which are known to be uh, a factor in this development. So our objective was to investigate the level of ages uh, in recent onset psychosis patients and to examine the relationship with traditional uh, cardiovascular risk factors as well as with demographic factors and clinical variables. And we included patients um, uh, of 18 years and older who had a, a recent onset psychosis in the schizophrenia spectrum. And we excluded patients with severe neurological disease or severe kidney failure, of which we had none. But this in, uh, increases your age level. Um, and we had two control groups. One was the validation cohort, where we received individual uh, patient data or subject data um, um, with data on age, gender, and uh, smoking status. And we collected our own control cohort uh, consisting of healthy medicine students at the University of Amsterdam who were not using psychotropic drugs, including no methylphenidate, which is an increasing problem with uh, students, uh, I should say, uh, no psychotic disorder or family history of uh, psychotic disorder. Uh, and we performed uh, multiple regression analysis, uh, uh, bootstrapping to have a uh, normal distribution. And when you do bootstrapping, you have to do a bias accelerated confidence interval to, um, uh, to make sure that you uh, have the right outcomes. Um, and we uh, looked at the uh, uh, skin ages in patients versus the validation cohort. And we looked within the patients whether the ages uh, uh, correlated with, uh, with the confounders that we assessed. And then we co corrected for that in the medicine student cohort. So these are um, um, the results. We uh, included 111 patients. And in uh, less than 80%, we were able to measure the skin ages. The ones who were, uh, who, where we didn't get uh, a measurement was because their skin color was too dark. So in, uh, that was in Holland, mainly Suriname uh, and Ghanese uh, patients. But patients from Morocco or Turkey, were, we were able to measure them. Uh, and as you can see, they were predominantly male. Uh, they had an age of average uh, 26 years, and half of them was Caucasian. And the average duration of disease was two years, and they uh, had uh, been prescribed antipsychotics uh, on average one and a half year before uh, inclusion. And this um, is how the skin ages uh, uh, do against the validation cohort. So as you can see, the uh, ages in patients are uh, increased. 
And when you control for age, gender, and smoking habits, it was uh, significantly increased by 15% on average in our patients. And when you compare that to the average accumulation of ages per year, this corresponds to um, an aging of more than 10 years. So already in this uh, early cohort, they had an increased um, age level. So when we looked within uh, our patient group how this uh, age measurement uh, um, correlated with uh, the factors, of course, we saw it correlated with age, that you would expect that, that you know, that's uh, uh, what the theory is. Uh, it also um, correlated with male gender, uh, with ethnicity, which is a very interesting thing because we know that ethnic minorities have an increased uh, incidence of psychosis. Um, but it also correlates with premature cardiovascular disease in the family history of patients. Um, it was not a very strong correlation, but uh, significant enough to mention. Um, and there was no correlation of the uh, odd fluorescence with the, the ages with other cardiovascular risk factors. So then we went on to uh, compare them with our healthy medicine students cohort. And as you can see in the graph, uh, it was also in this uh, uh, cohort, the patients had a significantly higher skin ages level, uh, whereby we also controlled for ethnicity. Unfortunately, we didn't ask in the medicine students whether they had uh, a family history of cardiovascular disease, so we were not able to control for that, but we don't think it has a large effect on the results. Um, and when we looked at clinical variables in our patients group, um, that's the last part of uh, my results, we saw a, a correlation with duration of illness, even in this uh, early uh, cohort, as well as with duration of antipsychotic use and cumulative exposure to antipsychotics. So when you convert all the antipsychotics to um, chlorpromazine equivalents and you uh, uh, look at uh, uh, how, how much, uh, what the dosage was at times, uh, how long they were using it, there was a significant relationship with age accumulation. So this is a, an interesting thing, and we know uh, that antipsychotics uh, can have an adverse effect on the uh, uh, levels of oxidative stress, so I think we have to um, be wary of that. Um, so to conclude, age accumulation is already elevated at the early stages of schizophrenia. Um, it's increased irrespective of traditional cardiovascular risk factors. And it's related, as we know uh, from uh, the talk of Daniela, it's related to oxidative stress as well as inflammation. And the relationship with exposure to antipsychotics de deserves further investigation, I think. Uh, also data on how antipsychotics can have a negative impact on the brain volume. Uh, and timely preventive treatment uh, of cardiovascular disease in our population is warranted, um, which this study further confirms. And, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and thank my collaborators, especially Julie Hagen, who has collected a lot of these data, uh, and uh, uh, Professor Liewe de Haan. Any questions? Um, maybe more clinical, what, what was your definition of um, um, early psychosis or... Um yeah, we, um, we included only patients who had an illness duration of less than five years. So that's, so the, um, our patients were um, uh, included in, in our facility if they had um, had uh, a treatment no longer than six months but this is like a cross-sectional um, assessment through our early psychosis services where we provide treatment for um, uh, no longer than three years. Yeah. And how was the age reader accepted by um, the patients? Yeah, that was interesting. They, um, I have to say, so if you look at the... Um, uh, so we all know that um, uh, they have maybe they have some habits which are not good for them in the long term as um, uh, when you look at cardiovascular risk. Um, um, but the patients often were in orange or in red already at a young age and if they got these results, because you can uh, um, um, 
after the assessment, you can choose to enter your age, and then you will see whether you are on the average or within the uh, standardized uh, the standard uh, the one standard deviation of the average. But most of the patients, or at least uh, half of them, were already in orange or, or red, and they were really startled. They really said, what can I do with this result? You know, I, I have an increased cardiovascular risk. Um, how can I uh, change that? And it was um, um, a strong motivation for some of these patients to do something about their uh, other cardiovascular risk factors. Because we cannot uh, lower the age accumulation, but we can uh, try to um, um, affect other uh, risk factors such as smoking and obesity and they, they were actually quite motivated to do something about it. Just one last question. Is um, <coughs> age used now for um, prediction for cardiovascular uh, disease? Is it used in, in It's in not used not? in standard clinical practice uh, as far as I'm, I'm aware, I'm, uh, at least not in, not in Holland. So there's a lot of research um, which uh, uh, in the diabetes field and cardiology field which has shown that this uh, age accumulation uh, makes a difference, but they have not uh, disseminated it um, uh, widely. As yet, yeah, I was looking to the website. Uh, how much it costs, and there are different type of uh, uh, edge readers. So, what else difference? You know a little bit. Um, if you uh, we um, uh, we bought an edge reader um, um, where we got a, a discount if because we were doing research with it, um, but then still you have to pay four thousand euros. Yeah. Um, and so uh, the investment uh, at the beginning is, I, I don't know if it's big, it depends on, on your budget, but um, 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 what is um, uh, a good thing about it is that it's, I mean, you, uh, you should do these um, metabolic measurements in your patients anyway, and uh, when you uh, incorporate this in your, uh, in your analysis, it's very easy. You, you do it within one minute. People lay their forearm on the uh, device, and you get a result within seconds. And you know you uh, run, run through the uh, variable list, and you're done within a minute. So that's the attractive thing of these measurements. And also, some patients don't like to uh, have their blood checked for cholesterol and glucose. Um, um, and you could say, wonder whether, if people have a high um, uh, age accumulation, if they can be motivated, uh, or that you have to be more stringent, you know, to say, okay, you really need your glucose checked or your cholesterol checked to see if we have to do something about that. Okay. Okay, then um, I think it's time to move on to our uh, next speaker. Um, I would like to introduce Marie, Marie Odio uh, Krebs. Um, who works as a psychiatrist at the University of uh, Paris and in the Hospital Saint Anne. Um, and she will present very intriguing data on uh, the uh, methylation changes that happen during conversion to psychosis, uh, and um, uh, which will deepen some information we heard already earlier today about exonal guidance. It was all a bit new material for me, but um, um, if uh, I understood it correctly, you will uh, tell something about that as well. Uh, apart from oxidative stress. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me and giving me uh, the opportunity to present these uh, results. Actually, uh, it should be uh, Usama Kebir and or Boris Schumet uh, talking, but none of them could come. Uh, actually, it's I dream of this uh, study, and they did it as uh, doctorant, postdoctorant um, in in the lab. So. Um, well, declaration of interest, okay. Uh, we all know this uh, uh, view of different stage in psychosis with a specific uh, focus for trying to understand better what happens when uh, people get uh, uh, to, into psychosis and whether we could uh, uh, improve a way to detect those who will develop the psychosis, but also whether we could prevent uh, the uh, onset of psychosis. And for many uh, studies now, it's now believed that there is a, an interaction between genetic vulnerability uh, uh, with environmental factors, 
uh, especially cannabis, stress, or other or infection, for example, and all this will lead to uh, epigenetic dysregulation. So we were uh, um, mostly interested to uh, look uh, this hypothesis uh, and try to demonstrate it. Epigenetic mechanism, very shortly, uh, can involve different kind of mechanism. The first one is uh, modification of uh, histone, uh, acetylation or methylation, but you will have also uh, regulations through uh, microRNA, and we were mostly interested in the uh, methylation of DNA on the CPG uh, site. Uh, when you want to study uh, prediction of psychosis, usually you compare those patients with at-risk mental states, so attenuated psychosis, or ultra-high risk patients, to uh, the, uh, the, so you, you, sorry, you compare at baseline those ultra-high risk who convert to psychosis uh, to uh, at-risk mental state who will not convert to psychosis. That's the way to try to uh, find some biomarkers who could predict the, the, the onset of psychosis. What we did here was uh, rather to uh, study uh, and get information about the process ongoing dur during the transition to psychosis. So we actually compare before and after uh, uh, psycho uh, psychosis onset and before uh, and after, uh, well, non-conversion non to psychosis. Okay, so, so this was done in a large uh, study. Now uh, we finished uh, recently the, the, the enrollment of patients. It's a one-year follow-up study that took place in the Paris, in my department, and especially uh, in, within the Centre d'Evaluation pour Jeunes Adultes et Adolescents, so that's kind of uh, evaluation center specialized for young adults and adolescents, uh, with different uh, steps for uh, uh, evaluation, uh, many, uh, well, of course, clinical evaluation, uh, and also biological samples taken not only at baseline, but also at, uh, um, uh, at after six months, after 12 months, or when they uh, convert to psychosis. And we decided to, after uh, categorizing the, 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 the subject in different subsample, uh, we decided to follow not only the at-risk mental states for one year uh, when they come back, um, but also those who didn't reach the, 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 the threshold for at-risk mental states. Only the patients with psychosis were not, they were referred to their uh, usual uh, uh, um, department for, for, for onset of uh, treatment and so on. So the whole sample is around uh, 300 persons uh, uh, included in the study, and this particular study was uh, uh, involved uh, 70 subjects as a whole. These are the main clinical characteristics. So the main results are done by, uh, by comparing converter to non-converter, but not only on baseline. We, we, conver we, we, we compare them for the changes from endpoint uh, minus baseline. Okay, so the, the change uh, during the, the, the duration of, uh, of the study. Um, what you see is, uh, is that they're not uh, different for, for, for most of the, uh, for actually for none of the, of the characteristic for substance use, etc. Um, so that's, a, that's, a, that's a, uh, uh, the design, uh, and we actually uh, uh, compare those patients, but we compare methylome at, um, at baselines to methylome at six months, okay? Uh, we used a very uh, um, a psych chip, uh, not a psych chip, uh, a chip array, uh, which is called MET 40, uh, 450 by Illumina. You have uh, 400, well, almost 500,000 uh, uh, points, so CPG analyzed. After many steps of uh, validity, cleaning data, etc., uh, only 411. Uh, thousand were taken into account, and you have many complicated states, uh, stage for uh, um, well dealing with the data and and uh, quality control, but also uh, um, to take into account uh, uh, these uh, uh, the, 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 the cells from where you you study the DNA. Uh, I must say that uh, this study was of course methylation was studied in in peripheral blood sample. 
so a simple blood sample with a specificity that you have to uh, froze your sample, your whole blood sample, very quickly. Nothing else is required. So we did two kind of analyses. First is uh, the, the, we, we look at uh, at regions we were differentially uh, methylated, and then also we, we look at positions so each CPG. When we, we look at uh, the, the differentially methylated uh, region, we found mostly two uh, uh, GMR uh, identified differently between when we compared converted and non-converted. One is located in, in, in uh, uh, chromosome one, and another uh, uh, cluster of six CPG were located in uh, uh, GST M5, which is a gene promoter of one of the enzymes in, involved in, 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 in redox regulation. These were times table in, in, the, in the analysis. We, we had uh, gender and uh, time as a as cofactor. Uh, this, this means that the change in methylation was all, uh, actually uh, already present before conversion to psychosis, meaning that they may already be different uh, in the way. We did also an exploratory uh, transversal analysis. Uh, who revealed three other uh, differentiated uh, methylation region, uh, including uh, uh, um, especially two genes uh, involved in uh, also in the glutathione uh, methyl region, GSTT1 and GSTP1, who actually are uh, acting uh, uh, as a reversal. Um, after uh, looking at the uh, results on the array, we, we, we try to uh, confirm our results by PIRO sequencing, which is a gold standard for methylation on these specific regions or, or, or CBG. Uh, and as you see, that, that there are, we confirmed this different, uh, different uh, place. And other uh, CPG were also different, uh, additional CPG in this uh, specific gene, GSTM5. Uh, so we confirmed the difference between converter and non-converter. So after that, we look at the different positions. So that's a, a Manhattan plot for you know, all the points. As you see uh, here, this is the uh, significant, uh, significant level threshold. Uh, none, of course, uh, it's a small sample. So none were uh, actually uh, positive. Uh, but we look at the uh, 100 best top results, as it can be done usually when you deal with those kind of results. So we select the uh, 100 best, uh, uh, most significant, most close to significance, and then we conduct a, a classification, so data-driven classification. Uh, and you see here are the converter, and here are the non-converter. And we, when it's red, it's a decrease of methylation. When it's green, it's an increase of methylation. As, as you see visually, there are some kind of difference. Of course, we cannot have a, a, a clear picture through this, so we, we conduct uh, analysis of these top results using different, uh, uh, different algori algorithms to see whether uh, these were uh, overrepresented in some specific pathway. So we found mostly two pathways in, involved in this, uh, in this uh, change in methylation through, through uh, conversion to psychosis. One is axon guidance with neuropilin-1 or CHL-1 uh, uh, or ephrin a, a 3 which are actually uh, uh, genes who, are, uh, who have already been involved in, in, in schizophrenia or, or neuroplasticity. And also uh, other uh, novel representation in the pathway of interleukin uh, uh, 17 signaling pathway, including ACATI1, who you know is, has been involved in schizophrenia, but also in the um, uh, as moderating the, the influence of cannabis in schizophrenia. So the main focus uh, there is that several of the results converge on the, uh, on the uh, glutathione metabolism. You have heard already a lot of information about, about this, uh, this uh, pathway. Um, GST uh, M5 is the most prevalent uh, enzyme of this pathway uh, expressed in the brain. Uh, it has been shown that it's don't regulate in schizophrenia. 
uh, and uh, hypermetallated. Uh, but also, so if, we, if these uh, exploratory results are true, we have also this picture with an additional um, uh, changes only after uh, conversion to psychosis with a hypomethylation of the GSTT1 and, and hypermethylation of GSTP1. So uh, we can say so this result suggests that conversion to psychosis is depending on very specific uh, control of oxidative metabolism and balance between these genes. Uh, by the way, when we look at the global methylation of the old, uh, old uh, CPGs, there was no significant difference for all the whole, uh, for all the whole uh, CPG sites. So I'll go fast on this. It's just to, to mention that, of course, glutathione is also is, is a kind of hub with a, a different uh, a convergent uh, mechanism like inflammation, microglia activation, but also glutamate trans, uh, transmission, which is uh, modified uh, 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 and in relation with uh, oxidative stress. Okay. So in conclusion. Uh, this is a uh, paper now published in uh, Molecular Psychiatry this year. Um, methylation change in the axon guidance, interleukin-17, glutathione redox coagulation pathway could reflect disruption in homeostasis that accompanies the emergence of full-blown psychosis. So it's a really, really dynamic, uh, um, uh, we capture a dynamic process. Uh, it is still unclear whether it has uh, actually a causal role in the process leading to psychosis or whether it only reflects uh, psychosis onset. We have checked, uh, well, the sample is, is small, of course, but we have tried to, to check for the influence of uh, onset of medication, uh, uh, and there was no, uh, no, 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 no difference. And we also checked for cannabis changes, cannabis onset or cannabis withdrawal, and uh, there was no difference in the results. So in, if true, uh, this uh, uh, results uh, uh, open new perspective for something new, which, which will be the phase-specific treatment rather than something uh, uh, only uh, in relation to, 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 to psychosis or schizophrenia. Uh, I mean, Oh, obviously, uh, uh, changes in, in uh, uh, glutathione uh, redox uh, uh, could also be involved in, the, uh, in depression and other anxiety disorders. So, uh, 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 something that it needs to be taken at this particular uh, time of the disease. So, that's the main uh, uh, author of this paper, Osama Kebir and Boris Chomet. Uh, Usama is still with us and, and will be very open to help anybody with uh, scripts for uh, methylation uh, uh, analysis. Uh, Boris Chomet is going to, to Montreal for a postdoc. Uh, I have to, to quote uh, uh, these uh, collaborators, Marie-Pierre Dubé, who is in the Cardiologic Institute in Mont uh, University of Montreal, and of course, uh, Guy Rouleau uh, uh, at the University of McGill, who helped us a lot with, uh, with uh, many uh, steps of the genetic studies. And this is a CJ, okay, and uh, we got some fundings, and now we are uh, uh, associated to the uh, um, European FP7 uh, um, EUGUI in French, EU. GEI. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for your attentions. Okay. Th thank you. Very uh, interesting data. Um, does anybody have a question? Um, are you planning to check now the uh, uh, protein level or enzymatic activity of this uh, glutathione-related enzymes in the blood of uh, all these patients or others? Yes, we, we, we have conducted a transcriptomic uh, analysis, and this specific uh, uh, enzyme did not come out uh, as change in the peripheral blood, but we found some of the, uh, uh, I mean for glutathione, uh, but one of them is one of the uh, a target uh, uh, is in it indeed changed. Uh, but I have to. Well, the paper is not uh, uh, out. <laughs> but uh, well, it will be followed yeah. up. Uh 
Yeah, yeah, of course, uh, it's really uh, important, but, but it's really important also to have this uh, uh, metamolic uh, uh, analysis the yeah. same way. Uh, we, we would like to, you know, to. I, I'm, I'm convinced that there are a lot of heterogeneity in our patients, and, uh, depending on uh, individual characteristic, but also to their exposure to different uh, environments. So we, we, we need to cross uh, as many as uh, omic pos uh, possible, so we to have a clear picture. Because if we do that in another samples with other patients, it will be very difficult. Yeah. But now we have to, to, of course, to well to have more confirmation, and yeah. larger samples, and so on. So, if I understand correctly, the uh, when you have these uh, methylation changes, uh, something occurred during your lifetime that uh, will. Uh, uh, change the enzyme activity, increase your oxidative stress in these patients, or the change the exon uh, guidance. Is there, um, from other studies, any indication what uh, uh, type of triggers can be involved? Uh, we had an earlier symposium on childhood trauma. I, I wonder if that has an influence on these methylation uh, uh, patterns. Do you know anything about that? Well, yes, uh, at least in animals. I'm not sure that it, is, it has been done in, in patients, but in animals you have methylation change, and, and cannabis also change uh, the profile of, of, of methylation in a number of, of, of uh, positions. Uh, it, it has also even been shown that uh, it can be transmitted to the next generation for stress and for cannabis. Uh, so, so yes, you could have some uh, pre-morbid changes in methylation that will uh, um, makes you more prone to, to transition to psychosis. But in the same way, we, we, we found these changes during transition could be, which could be uh, actually uh, um, well more in relation to the process right. ongoing of during becoming, transition. Uh, to go of going into transition. Yeah. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, and as our uh, last speaker, uh, I would like to uh, introduce Philip Baumann, uh, who is a psychiatrist working at the uh, Treatment and Early uh, Intervention in Psychosis program, also known as uh, TIP, uh, and uh, at the Center of Psychiatric uh, Neurosciences in Lausanne. And he will present uh, very interesting translational work, uh, looking at the relation between uh, brain circuit functioning and oxidative stress measures in early psychosis. Okay, thank you. <coughs> um, so you've um, seen this um, figure before from um, Daniel Advir, um, so where um, an MDA receptor hypofunction, redox dysregulation, and um, inflammation um, are in full interaction and form a hub and um, converge um, and generate oh, oxidative stress. Um, and also gene and environment um, interact and, and converge on, on this hub. And then eventually um, 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 trigger or um, dysfunction in, in, in circuits. Um, I will focus um, on um, this pathway. Um, and it's interesting to <coughs> to note that actually um, known environmental uh, risk factors for, for schizophrenia um, generate transient or long-term um, oxidative stress um, at the periphery or uh, centrally um, in the brain. Um, evidence for oxidative stress actually um, um, there's several lines of evidence for oxidative stress in, in schizophrenia. And um, the evidence can actually be broadly separated in sort of two, um, two categories. <coughs> One which uh, rather looks at the consequence of oxidative stress, and other <coughs> uh, which have to do with um, antioxidant um, defense. Um, consequence of oxidative stress are, for example, increased uh, lipid peroxidation. Okay. Wrong button, um, and anti antioxidant defense, uh, for example, um, glutathione, like you've heard before, or um, um, antioxidant enzyme like um, GPX that I will discuss a bit later um, in the talk. Um, earlier, I work from um, Kim Do looked at um, the GCLC gene. Um, you've heard that from Daniela Advir before. 
um, and they showed actually that there's polymorphism um, in this gene, and there's um, a low risk and a high risk genotype. The high risk is the one um, associated um, with the disease. And then they looked um, at glutathione concentration in um, the fibroblasts. And so um, high-risk patients actually show um, lower glutathione content in these fibroblasts um, when they're challenged with um, oxidative stress. So that's actually at the periphery. Um, but what about centrally um, in the brain? Um, and this question was um, addressed by um, Li Jingxin from um, the group of Rolf Grüter. And so she um, performed um, MRS, magnetic uh, resonance spectroscopy, in the medial prefrontal cortex to um, assess glutathione concentration. And again, she compared um, the low-risk genotype and the high-risk genotype. And so um, the GCLC high-risk genotype um, predicted low um, prefrontal uh, glutathione concentration. Um, OK. so. What has been important um, for us is to go back and forth between um, uh, the animal model and the patients. Um, I've discussed in the patients so about the polymorphism in the GCLC gene. Um, and then in the animal model, like Dania, Daniela Dvier also described, um, the GCLM knockout mouse, um, which has a 70% decrease in glutathione and so several uh, phenotypes reminiscent of, of the disease. So I will actually, um, in this talk, discuss um, two studies. Uh, one that looks at the myelin and, um, and white matter integrity in relation to oxidative stress, first in um, mice and also um, a related study in uh, patients. And then um, a longitudinal DTI study in these uh, same mice and then also um, a similar study um, in, in patients. Okay, so this was a study um, done by um, Aline Monin um, in the animal model. So she was um, interested in, in, in um, oligodendrocytes, so which are um, important for um, uh, conduction velocity of, of the, um, the neurons, but also to maintain um, integrity and functions of, um, of the neurons. And so her first study um, was um, in vitro. Um, in, with a 30% decrease in, in glutathione. And what she showed is that there was an, an impairment um, in oligodendrocyte uh, maturation um, in, in this condition. And then she went um, again in vivo into the animal model, the GCLM knockout mouse, and where she found um, that there was a decrease um, in oligodendrocyte and myelin markers um, in um, the anterior cingulate of, of these mice. And so the idea then was to go back to patients. And, and so again, with um, Li Jingxin, um, we measured um, glutathione concentration uh, prefrontally, and also um, with um, diffusion imaging. So here, um, diffusion spectrum imaging, uh, we assessed um, FA, or white matter integrity, um, along uh, the single bundle. And then we looked at the relationship between um, glutathione and, um, and white matter integrity. And we found um, a positive relationship um, in controls and also in, in patients. So um, we concluded that um, glutathione and redox dysregulation um, have a critical role um, in myelination process and white matter maturation in um, prefrontal cortex of rodents and, and humans. But now, uh, which um, fiber bundles are affected um, under um, low uh, glutathione conditions? So this question was addressed by um, Alberto Corcoba. And so he again looked at the same mouse model, g knockout mouse, and he performed um, 14 Tesla um, DTI um, in a longitudinal um, way. Um, and what he found is that one of the um, fiber bundles which was affected was the fornix fimbria, uh, which was affected in the mouse model at the peripuberty, and which actually um, remained affected um, throughout, um, throughout adulthood. And then the next question was, well, what's the functional basis of, of this decrease of FA? And this was looked at by uh, Pascal Stöhle, who looked at um, um, conduction velocity um, in the same uh, bundle, and he found um, decreased um, conduction velocity in, in the fimbria fornix. Um, 
And then here again, the idea was to go back to the patients. So, um, well, there are many good reasons actually to be interested in, in the fornix. It's the main output of the hippocampus. And of course, hippocampus has been um, implicated, um, let's say, um, with large evidence in schizophrenia and psychosis. And of course, um, the fornix is important in um, cognition and, and aspects of memory. So um, the questions were the following: <clears throat> Is there white matter? Are there white matter alterations in the fornix um, in early psychosis? Um, and what are the relationship with um, hippocampus integrity? Um, and second question: um, uh, What's the correlation between um, integrity um, in the fornix hippocampus circuit um, with um, um, with MGPX activity? Um, Okay, so our patients were recruited from um, our early psychosis program in, in Lausanne, the TIP um, program, and we recruited um, 42 patients and 42 controls. Uh, they were matched for age, gender, um, and uh, handedness. And so uh, here briefly the method. So um, patients underwent um, structural imaging and um, diffusion spectrum imaging, and we assessed the hippocampus volume with um, FreeSurfer software. And then um, <clears throat> to uh, delineate or segment the fornix, what we did, we placed um, a sphere in, um, in the body of the fornix and then just selected all fibers connecting the hippocampus to the sphere, which allowed to, um, to isolate or delineate um, the fornix bundle in the following way. And so what, we, what did we find? Um, so what we found is that in patients, um, there was a decrease in um, FA or white matter integrity in patients. Um, and we found also a decrease of volume in patients. And actually there was uh, quite a nice correlation also between um, the decrease um, in FA in the fornix and the decrease in volume in, um, in patients, which was absent in, um, in controls. Okay. <clears throat> now we'll come just briefly back to um, the work by, um, by Li Jingxin um, uh, on the spectroscopy. So um, what she looked at first, she was also interested in, in this GPX, which is um, an antioxidant enzyme, which helps um, to detoxify um, hydrogen peroxide by oxidizing glutathione, and then um, glutathione is, by, is reduced back by um, the GR glutathione reductase. Um, and so this was assessed in blood. And then she correlated that with um, glutathione concentration again in, in the prefrontal cortex. And what she found actually is a negative relationship. Um, so in other words, um, higher GPX activity um, was correlated with or related with um, lower um, glutathione um, concentration. So in other words, um, yeah, higher um, peripheral oxidative status was also associated with um, lower um, glutathione concentration. So what we did next, again, we looked at um, GPX activity in the periphery in, in blood um, here, and we correlated it with hippocampus volume. And what we found is that um, lower hippocampus volume was associated with um, higher GPX or higher peripheral um, oxidative um, status. And so that's in patients. And this relationship was, um, was absent um, in, in controls. Um, now if you come back to the literature, so there were actually two uh, recent reports um, showing decrease of um, FA in, in the fornix in, um, in early psychosis. Of course, there are um, numerous um, also studies um, showing decreased volume and also altered diffusion properties um, in the hippocampus in psychosis and schizophrenia, um, especially uh, also left in the early stages. On the neuropathological level, um, there are um, decreased um, PV interneurons in, um, in the hippocampus. Um, and interestingly also, um, <coughs> in, in the same um, GCLM knockout mouse model, um, Pascal Stöhle described actually a decrease of integrity and function also of the same uh, PV interneurons um, in, in the hippocampus. So this may be sort of a, a basis uh, through um, decreasing neuropile of, of decrease of, of, of volume. 
So in conclusion, um, glutathione and redox regulation um, play an important role in myelination and white matter maturation and prefrontal cortex of rodents and humans. Um, early psychosis patients um, compared to controls have a um, lower GFA in the fornix as well as a uh, smaller hippocampus volume that was especially on the left. And also there's a loss of integrity in the fornix. Um, this correlates with loss of integrity in the hippocampus in patients. And finally, um, in early psychosis patients, but not in controls, um, there was an association between um, peripheral oxidative status and brain structure here on um, the hippocampus. Finally, um, thank you for all, uh, also to all um, the people um, involved in this study, and also especially to Kim Do and, um, and Philippe Gonus, and also um, um, to the fund different fundings. Well, thank you for, to your, for your attention. Thank you, uh, Philippe, um, and thank you for bearing with us uh, in this uh, last symposium. Uh, are there any questions? Um, I do have a question uh, because um, uh, when you look at uh, the oxidative uh, stress, uh, and it's, uh, it seems to be related to the hippocampal volume and the fornix integrity, did you also look at the effect on cognition of this? Uh, in this model? We haven't really integrated the, the cognition yet, but we, we could, yes. We yep. have the, the matrix battery for, for some of the patients. Right. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. It's actually a question for, for you and Daniela, because I'm not sure to, uh, to get the point. You say that accumulation of uh, age is sort of uh, leads to, has a negative impact. I was just wondering if you were to, to do what you propose to block activation of rage, would this, I think you asked the question, but I was not sure of the, of the answer. Would it lead to an accumulation and then have a negative impact, or do you think? Because it seems to be positive in the sense that it would prevent inflammation, then a vicious cycle with redox dysregulation. But then, would it, uh, you know? Yeah, I, I think what uh, Daniela showed is that if the, the oxidative stress um, 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 sheds the, the receptor for ages, so um, oxidative stress would also in turn increase the plasma levels of, uh, of ages, so which would further contribute to uh, inflammation and oxidative stress. So, um, so it will, I think it will actually contribute to the feed-forward uh, uh, circuit. Yeah. And um, uh, age accumulation could be, um, um, could be something that is, um, uh, uh, which shows accumulation of oxidative stress actually during lifetime. And so, of course, you have to correct for other um, uh, other effects. But um, and when we measure plasma levels of oxidative stress, it's of, we know, of course, uh, there is a high variation, and this could be like a longitudinal uh, uh, effect. But we have to uh, we will delve uh, deeper into that uh, to see whether that's actually an uh, increased oxidative stress during lifetime. Yeah, what we suspect. suspect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, more, more clinically, is it, uh, is it advised now to measure age? In, in, because what we do usually is to measure um, waste uh, and, and all yeah. that and yeah. hypertension. Is it now in, in the... It's not in the, in the guidelines uh, as yet. Uh, it's very easy to, to, uh, to implement in clinical practice, but it's not, uh, 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 as far as I'm, I know, that it's not in the uh, clinical guidelines uh, as yet. To measure these as well, I, I think it would make sense. Yes, yes. Okay. One last question, and then uh, we will release everybody. Yes. Um, have you looked at the um, maybe um, relationship of age with um, symptomatology? I mean, you've um, talked, I think, about the DUP, um, yeah. duration of illness, duration of antipsychotics, yeah, and so on. Yeah, we still have to look into the uh, uh, to the effect. Of Higher symptoms, or, uh, and uh, we will also look into uh, brain volume changes. Uh, whether uh, this age accumulation is a negative effect on that, so uh, there are still a lot of things to be assessed, as you said as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.